Testing. Well, good morning again. How many of you are happy this morning? Are you happy? Good, that makes this next part much easier. Yay! We're going to be cheerful givers, amen? And I can tell you a whole bunch about giving and what that looks like, and, but I will tell you this. If it's one penny, one peso, or if it's a million dollars, what do you think God's going to bless if it comes from your heart? If it comes from your heart, it really doesn't matter. But the one thing that I see, this is what I know about Crossroads. Every bit of our finances are met. And we have all the money that we need. Isn't that a blessing? Here's the other part of that. It's still in your pocket. So, <laughs> God's going to bless whether it's a penny or whether it's a million dollars. But give as your heart gives. If you can't give a million dollars with a smile on you, your face and in your heart, please don't do it. But if you can give that penny with the biggest smile, Abraham Lincoln's our friend, amen? So this morning as we uh, go into our, this part of our worship, um, Brian and Jose are coming to take up our, our offering and we're gonna do some housekeeping stuff. You get that big banner. I don't even say that. You know what you said. <laughs> Lunch Munch today is going to El Tizoncito, which is on Lemon. Y'all remember where that is? Yes. Right down there across from Racetrack Gas Station. All right? What's it called? El Tizoncito. Say that fast. El Tizoncito. Yeah, yeah, that's what he said. El Tizoncito. Sounds like he said, I tease you with a Cheeto. I don't know what he said. <laughs> <laughs> he teased me with a Cheeto. I love it. <laughs> Well, good morning. As we are um, getting our offering, I just want to remember to pray for Pastor Bob and Pastor Kathy, both of who are traveling this weekend. Um, I know that we've got several. I, this group right here, they're all gone. Huh? They're, they're all gone. They're just, we miss y'all in your empty seats. Um, but remember to pay, pray for Pastor Bob and Pastor Kathy. Uh, both the believers are having time with family for the Labor Day holidays. Um, I don't know why they call it Labor Day because nobody works on that day. It's, will you work tomorrow? You're, oh yeah, we're closed and I'm not. And I'm, I told them don't call me because I'm not coming. How many of you have had a great week? And then how many of you just lied? <laughs> how many of you have had an awesome week? How many of you know that no matter what your week was like, the God is still on the throne. That was the kind of week that I had. I had one of those weeks where I couldn't say that it was awesome, but I had to keep reminding myself that God was still on the throne. And each morning when I got up, tired, staggering to the bathroom to brush my teeth and take a shower and get ready for another work day, I, I told myself, instead of saying, oh, I have to go to work, I said, I get to go to work. And I try to make that my daily mantra. I get to go to work because so many people don't have that opportunity. So I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed beyond measure to have um, gainful employment. I just wish we would gain a little bit more. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Brian and Jose, thank you. For those of you who are involved in our um, Bible study group, we will be kicking Bible study up again after we get to the Labor Day. It will not be this Wednesday. Um, and look forward to it. I actually should have some information next week. We're not going to meet at my house uh, just because I love my house, but it's all the way in DeSoto, and I don't want that to be uh, a reason for someone not to come. So we will start again on Wednesdays, probably 7.30. And I, I believe that our first meeting, we're going to actually be in the parlor at Sissy's Southern Fried Chicken. So uh, how many of you have ever been to Sissy's Southern Fried Chicken? This is a shameless plug. Come eat with us. <laughs> um, but I believe that that's where, where we'll be um, a week from this Wednesday. If that changes, I will let you know. But um, we've had some really, really good, exciting times and learned some things that we didn't, that we didn't know before. But we're going to go on and get kicked up again. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. How many of you want to be satisfied? How many of you want to just be comfortable? How many of you just want God to just bless you? I know I do. I do, I do, I do. And my question is, are you hungry? See, there's a difference in just coming to church and, like my mom used to say, playing church. Oh, I go to church because that's what I just, I'm supposed to do on Sunday. I go to church because um, my friends, everyone I know goes to church, and so that's what I do, I go to church. My question is, are you hungry? Are you hungry for the things that God has for you? Now, let me say this. Oftentimes, we come to church expecting to receive, amen? And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But let's flip our mindset a little bit and say, what would life be like if we went to church with the expectation of what we can give? And I'm not talking monetary. But what we can give to God. I believe, and I'm a little afraid of it, because, see, I, I, I can only deal in reality. I can only deal with what I know, right? So things that I don't know are frightening to me. Tap that wall behind you. What is that made of? Stucco. Stucco? Yeah. You think there's some stone behind there? Because if that wall started screaming, I would lose my mind. I think I would run out of here and leave y'all in here with a screaming wall. <coughs> but the word of God says that if you don't praise me, I don't need you to because the very rocks will cry out. Could you imagine the rocks underneath your feet and all the walls and everything around you start just worshiping like mad? I don't know what that would do to my mind. I think it would scramble me a little bit. And I don't want that to happen because ain't no rock going to cry out in my place because I'm hungry. How many of you are hungry this morning, hungry for every good gift that God has for you? That's where we need to be. And you're not you when you're hungry. Now, I don't want to be me if I'm hungry because if I'm me, I'm in myself, I'm in everything that I want. It's all about Wayne, 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 Wayne. But when I'm hungry, I'm seeking after the things that God has for me, amen? And if I'm seeking after the things that God has for me, what does scripture say? Seek ye what? Second? First? Does it say first? Oh my gosh, say it again. Seek me what? First. Seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and everything else. It didn't say a little bit of it you added to you. It said everything else will be added to you. That's filling my hunger. That's giving me what I need, it's feeding me. I don't want to be me. I want to be hungry. I want to know that I know that I know that I'm constantly seeking after the things that God has for me. John 6, 27 says, don't waste your energy. This is from the message version. Striving for perishable food. Work for the food that sticks with you. Food that nourishes your lasting life. Food the Son of Man provides. He and what he does are guaranteed by God the Father to last. Yes, Snickers may satisfy, right? How many of you love Chinese food? And I love me some Chinese food. I can eat it all day long. But the one thing I know about Chinese food is I might be hungry about an hour later. And so I just make sure that I order enough so that I can eat a little bit more later. But I love it says, that the food that God gives is gonna last. I'm not gonna be hungry later unless I'm hungering for more of God's goodness. But we've gotta be in that place where we are saying, I'm hungry, Lord, I'm hungry, Lord. Feed me till I want no more. Amen? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. What does that mean? What does it mean for Jesus to be the bread of life and for Jesus to be that one that's going to feed us. 
Anyone. Everything. He's everything. I like that. Thank you, Sean. Someone else. Satisfying. Manna from heaven. I will feed you because I am that bread of life. And if you eat of me, what? Will you still be hungry? You will hunger no more. Amen? On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took that bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he said, take and eat for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For three years, here's Christ walking. And forgive me for this next part that I'm about to say, but with 12 unreliable, get on your nerves half the time mumbling idiots. They complained about everything. Oh, Jesus, they're casting out demons in your name. Should we tell them to stop? And Jesus said, it's in my name. What is, what's the problem? But he walked with them. Were they perfect? Yeah. Did Jesus know that they weren't perfect? Yes. But one thing that Jesus knew was that I can teach them because they are hungry. They want to know. They want to learn. We can say whatever we want about Peter sinking in that water. Ask me which one of those other 11 got out of that boat. Not a single one of them, but Peter, by faith, got out. They often say Peter was the apostle with the, with the foot-shaped mouth because he was always putting his, mouth, his, his foot in his mouth, always saying something crazy and something wrong, but Jesus still loved him. I'm here to tell you I'm always saying something crazy and I'm always saying something wrong and every day I fail. But I thank God that God still loves me. I thank God that I, I don't have to be, or as, as I mentioned earlier, that Jesus doesn't treat me like my sins deserve. Because when he sees me and when he sees you, what does he see? Absolutely. Like that old song says, he sees his righteousness. He sees his Holy Spirit filling up that emptiness. He sees the blood that he shed. Jesus sees himself each time he looks at us. And that, to me, is a blessing in itself. And that's what I'm hungry for. That is what I'm hungry for. But I'm not just hungry. I'm, I'm a little thirsty today, too. Anybody thirsty? What do you want to drink? Somebody tell me what you want to drink. I get you one. I, I send a waiter out to get you. What you want? You want some Coca-Cola? How about some, some red Kool-Aid? Y'all act like I ain't never drank red Kool-Aid. Don't look at me like I'm the only one. You stay with me. <laughs> some iced tea. How about some living water? Yum. I love it. It's refreshing, yes? That living water, that water that's going to make sure that you will never, ever thirst again. I wish that I could be somewhere in that, in that courtyard when Jesus was talking to that woman at the well. He revealed everything about her. The good, the bad, the ugly, the things that she even tried to hide. And he said, I can give you water where you'll never thirst still thinking carnal-mindedly, what did she say? Well, what are you going to dip the water out of the well with? You have no cup. You, where's your bucket? If I were Jesus, because you know Jesus could be a little snarky sometimes. I made the bucket, girl. What you mean? Where's the bucket? But he said, I'm going to give you water, living water, where you will never thirst again. Sometimes, I just wish I could almost drown in that water. <laughs> almost drown. Lord, just keep pouring it over me and over me and over me and over me. But don't pour so much on me that I forget what thirst is like. Don't feed me so much that I forget what hunger is like. Because if I forget what thirst and what hunger is, 
I cease to seek after the things of God, amen? And that's gonna be a really, really ugly place for me. In my journey, I did a lot, I, I've done a lot of things. But in 2009, in March of 2009, I found myself in the darkest place that I'd ever been. And it was a very, very strange place. I was living in Omaha, Nebraska, and I was co-pastoring um, First Lutheran Church. And I went to my co-pastor, Pastor Judith, and I said, this is it. I'm quitting. I just need to resign. And she said, OK, well, let's talk about this. and let's, let's do a timeline and, and give you time to pray about it. And I said, no, I'm quitting today. I'm done. I don't want any more. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm not enjoying this anymore. And what it was was that I had stopped hungering and I had stopped thirsting and I had allowed myself to get into a place of just utter depression. And I wish that I could tell you that there were comforting words spoken to me that pulled me out of it and reminded me that Jesus is Lord and everything's going to be okay. But that's not what happened. See, March 31st was a really dark day for me. And that dark day lasted until October 17th. My bishop wouldn't accept my resignation. But what that did for me was force me to be somewhere that I really wasn't prepared to be. And so I lived in the parsonage, which is right across from the church. And that is, if you've ever been in a church that has a parsonage and the pastor lives right there, that is the worst place in the world for anybody to live because they constantly knock on your door. They, for everything, and you just want to be left alone. Did you see my lights are on? Do you know it's 3 o'clock in the morning and I don't want to talk to you? And I'm trying very hard. You know, I tell everybody all the time, I'm a dog, I'm a scoundrel, I will cut you. <laughs> but it's the Jesus in me that saves your life every day. I want to keep the light of Christ right here, shining bright all the time, but from March 31st to October 17th, that light was flickering. It was out. I had to change the bulb when I didn't even want to change the bulb. It took 20,000 people to change one light bulb because I just was not getting it. I didn't want it. I wasn't hungry. I wasn't thirsty. I was in a dark, dark desert. And one day, Pastor Judith crossed over through my backyard knocked on my door, I opened the window and said, go away, it's Saturday, I don't want to be bothered. And she said, you forget, I have a key. <laughs> <laughs> and she came on in, and she marched right up to my room, and she came in, I was laying there in my bed, and she said, we're going to pray until we can't pray anymore, but this ends today. It was October 17th. And she said two things to me. You need to be hungry and you need to be thirsty. I will tell you that I needed to drink as much as I could because there was a deluge of water. Just I cried more than I'd ever, ever cried because I was able to release all of that darkness. Did the thing that made my life so dark go away, it was still there. But I found a place in which I could be hungry again, in which I can be thirsty again. And God sent me the best waitress that he could to remind me that there was a table set before me. How many of you have ever served tables before? It's not an easy job. I do it every day. And you deal with some really ugly, ugly people. I'll give you an example. Last night, there was a man. You notice I did not call him a gentleman. There was a man, and this man 
was about the ugliest that he could possibly be. And so my server came to me, and this was a, it was an interesting situation because his table's here, and it just so happened, because I don't work Saturday nights, but our owner and her husband had friends in from out of town, and she won't let anybody else take care of her but me. So I said, okay, I, I'll, I'll work tonight. I'll take care of you. He's sitting right here. He's furious with his server, but he's been ugly, 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 and he's getting louder and louder and louder. And I think, you know, I try my best because she will get up. And if she gets up, there's one of two things that's gonna happen. This situation is getting uglier, <laughs> or she's gonna feel like she has to work. And that's not what you want. You don't want your boss to feel like you, they have to work because you're not doing your job. So I invited the man to come and speak to me out in the hallway. And he began to tell me why I was such a lousy piece of crap, blah, 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 blah. Now, mind you, this was the first conversation that I ever had with him. I wasn't his server. And I explained to him, I said, sorry, I'm, I, I'm the manager, and I, you know, what can we do? How can we make this right? And he said, you're just some piece of crap server. And I looked at him, and that's something that just rose up from my toes. And I went like this, and I said, and I'm a server that loves you and wants to make sure that you leave here happy. And he had nothing else to say. He just went. And I'm glad that I have a boss that will support me. Because my boss, the reason why she loves me and trusts me is because she knows if she's got a problem, she's going to pull me to the office and say, come on, Wayne, let's pray. And I love that about my job. I walked the man to the front. I found out what the entire issue was. The entire issue was that we had made a mistake that we should not have made. We had done something that we shouldn't have done and we should have corrected it before it got worse and it, it was too late. The man was already angry and so I invited him to come back. I invited him to let me take care of him and this spitting, screaming, crazy man before he left gave me a hug and told me thank you. How many of you have ever been a server before? We have a responsibility, servers, we know this. And for those of you who have never actually served a table, put your aprons on because I'm fixing to tell you what you need to do. To some people, you will be the only Christ that they see. You will be the only one that can give them, that can set that table before them to tell them that God is love and God is mercy and God is grace, amen? That may be all that you can do. And I will tell you that I shocked his system when I told him I loved him. I'm a server that loves you and wants to take care of your issue. I'm that person who wants to make sure that I can show you everything that Christ can be. But when we get into self and we let that, <clears throat> that rises up in us, cause our light to flicker, we can miss an opportunity. And that person can walk away starved, but not hungry. Parched, but not thirsty. And we've allowed them to stay in that desert place, whereas we could have fed them and we could have served them. How many of us in this room are servers? That would be all of us. And we have that responsibility. I'm responsible to Doug, and Doug is responsible to me. I'm responsible to Missy, and Missy is responsible. I am responsible for Matt. Matt? Jeez, I almost said Mark, and it was like, well, I know it's one of those apostles. Oh, is that what it was? Okay, well, next time y'all bring Luke and John, we're gonna be complete. I love it. We're responsible for one, for one another, amen? And for serving and for giving. God has placed us in valuable positions so that we are royal priesthood. I am a child of the most high God. And if God is our king, what does that make you? And if you're royalty, what does that make you? Honey, there's a lot of princesses in here. You're not one of them. Hang on. Uh, but you can be if you want. <laughs> I 
love you. We have that responsibility to serve and to make sure that we teach those to hunger and to thirst after righteousness. On the final and climactic day of the feast, Jesus took his stand and he cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Rivers of living water will brim and spill out of the depths of anyone who believes, me in, it believes in me this way, just as the scripture says. He said this in regard to the spirit whom those who believed in him were about to receive. The spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Folks, Jesus has been glorified. Amen? That spirit has been given. And we can drink, and we can drink, and we can drink. And rivers of living water should flow from us because Christ lives in us. Amen? Sometimes, I'm about to age myself. How many of y'all remember that movie, Sybil? Sometimes, I, how, how are you old enough to remember Sybil? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Good one. Sometimes I feel like Sybil. And I'm like, oh, oh. And it was, I'm so glad that some people can't see me because sometimes when it looks like I'm talking to myself and I'm really having an argument with God, don't look at me like I'm the only one that argues with God. God always wins. <laughs> So it's kind of a moot point. But sometimes I feel like civil and it's God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit and I'm trying to get it all wrapped up together. But the one thing that I know is that while God the Father is in God's kingdom and God the Son came, died, resurrected, and is in God's kingdom, that Holy Spirit is right here with me every single day to make sure that I can say to an ugly man, I'm a, I love you and I'm the server that wants to take care of your issue. To make sure that I can say to each person that I come in contact with, I love you. Let me show you how to be hungry. Let me show you how to be thirsty. Now, let me feed you. Today is Communion Sunday. For me, this is one of the most powerful times in my journey as a Christian, is to be able to take of those elements on the night that Jesus was betrayed. He took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and he passed it to each one of them and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me and in a like manner after supper Jesus took the cup and blessed it and passed it to each of them saying, this is my cup. This is the new covenant that I give for you. Hope, love, there's so much in that cup. Now I want to paint a picture for you. I'm going back to the Old Testament to where there was the Holy of Holies. And this Holy of Holies was something else. It was something to be feared because it's two rooms. And so there was the outer room that the priest can go into. And anybody could go into this room, but pretty much it was a priest. But there was that inner chamber that nobody could go into except for the high priest. And you know, they would tie a rope around his waist so that if he went in there and dropped dead, they could pull him out because they couldn't go in there. Because not everybody can stand in God's presence and live at that time. Especially if you went in there unclean. Especially if you went in there with your heart and mind torn and divided. Many a priest, they had to pull out with that rope because they weren't ready. Today, we can step into the Holy of Holies. We live in the Holy of Holies because God's presence is all around us. And because of the blood of Christ, we have liberty, permission, freedom to be in that very presence of God. Amen? 
there's no place, no better place for me to be than in God's presence. There was an old cowboy who went to church, went to this church, first time and he'd ever been there. He wasn't dirty. Boots had a little mud on them, but that's because he was a working man. Jeans were clean, pressed, shirt nice, had his little hat on, kerchief around his neck, and he walked into this church and everyone's dressed to the health. They were, they were, they were dressed like they were going to meet somebody important. And so he came in and he went up to the front and he sat on the front row, but as he came in, murmur, 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 and people moved away from him. And nobody sat next to him. But he sat and he listened. And he listened to the preacher and he listened to the preacher and he listened to the preacher. And afterwards, he made his way out. The preacher was in the back ready to shake everyone's hand. And he stuck his hand out to shake the pastor's hand. And the pastor did not return to shake his hand. And he said, well, I'm so glad you're here, son. So next time you come, I want you to uh, pray about what you're to wear uh, before, you, before you come to church here. The man looked at him and he said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. So the next Sunday he comes in his mud caked boots, his jeans nice and pressed, shirt looking good. Goes up to the front, murmur, 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 murmur. People move away from him. He sits down. He listens to the pastor. Gets ready to leave. He reaches out to shake the pastor's hand. The pastor did not take his hand. And he said, son, I, I thought I asked you to, to pray and ask God about what you should wear before you came to church. He said, well, I, I did, sir. I did pray. Well, if you prayed about it, what did God say? He said, I don't know. I've never been there. I don't want God to say that he's never been here. I don't want God to say that he's never been here. But I want God to say, and I want everyone to know that when you see me, you see an ambassador of Christ. You see somebody that wants to lead you to a place of truth and righteousness, the place that will make you hunger, a place that will make you thirsty. Not because I am one of your pastors is that my job. That is our job. Because we are a priesthood of all believers. Amen. And so we have a responsibility for those around us, those that we work with, the neighbors that we can't stand because they're too loud, the stanky person at the, at the mall. You know the ones that we talk about. Oh, what child, what is she wearing? You know we do that. Instead of giving them God's grace, we want to say, mm -hmm, I'm guilty. The great thing about that is that the Holy Spirit that lives in me convicts me every time I even think it. So more times than not, it tries not to come out of my mouth. And if it does come out of my mouth, I hear a friend of mine sitting in the back row saying, inappropriate. God placed that little man in my life to put that inappropriate in my head so that I always hear it when something is not right. We have a responsibility to each other, amen? Anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the master irreverently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. I'm going to read that part again because I want it to sink in. Anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the master irreverently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on Christ at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be a part of? Examine your motives. Test your heart. Come to this meal in holy awe. I want you to take a moment now. Can you find me some mood music? <laughs> I want you to take a moment now to look within your heart. Oh, you know what? Stop, Missy. I forgot. 
I want you to look into your heart to examine yourself and think about today, yesterday, and many yesterdays. Think about those who have hurt you and those that you have hurt. Get to a place where you can, will release that. Let it go. Let God reign and be supreme in your life. Examine your heart to see what is what's separating you from a full and powerful experience with God. Examine your heart to see what's blocking you from the anointing that God has for you. Dare I say that most of us walk, if not all of us, walk in that anointing. But how much of that anointing can be so much more powerful if we allow God to be God and we get out of the way? How much of that anointing can be so much more powerful and the lives that we come in contact with, we can affect change because we allow God to be bigger than we are in ourselves. We're going to have a, a time of just quiet. Just look within your heart. Take time between you and God and no one else to where you can just let it go. Let God be God. Let God take away every bit of that guilt. Let God take away every bit of those things that separate you from Him, from His love, from His presence, from His anointing, from you hungering thirsting for everything that God has for you. Take a moment to do that now. Lay hands on him. 